Hey, this is Andy Moore from SCO Design Lab in Austin, Texas, and in this presentation we'll be discussing vector forms created in Illustrator, specifically focusing on using color gradients and blending modes to make the most of things. Alright, so we're going to begin with this form, which is a rough sketch one of our clients sent us for a logo concept. Um, they also sent us a reference image. Uh, the elements of this picture that they wanted incorporated into their shield was the very clean cut chrome effects, like you got a lot of light dark edges, and these are things that they're actually pretty hard to produce using only vector lines or even vector shapes, but we can capitalize on all of the minute details using color gradients and blending multiple gradients of the same form and uh, that's what we'll be focusing on uh, for this presentation so first thing I'm going to do here is actually create this as a, a vector form first by making the lines and then filling in the shape okay, okay. So when I'm working, I oops. Yeah, there we go. All right. When I'm working, I tend to use keybinds a lot, and I like having a clean screen to focus on what I'm looking at. Uh, so if you kind of get confused or lost in terms of what tool I'm using, you can reference this little word down here where it says pen. Um, and as I switch in between tools, you'll notice it also switches. So that would be a pretty good way of keeping up with what I'm doing here. Since this is a symmetrical form, oops, don't want that. <laughs> I actually want a line. The first thing I want to do is, I don't need to make this whole shape. I only really need to make half of it because it's completely symmetrical. Um, or rather, it has a plane of symmetry. So I'm just going to put a, a center line right here and then create this top half. Oh. Might have overextended ourselves here with the curves. I'm going to snip this one. Let's get some uh, resolution for this last bend. We'll pick up on that last point. And, oops. Okay, good. <laughs> so before I finish this curve off, I want to make sure that this bottom segment, the one on the left side, is actually not curving inwards, nor do I want it bowing out. I want it to be fairly plain because I am going to mirror this and if it's bowed in like that we'll have like a heart more than we'll have a shield you know and that can kind of probably make a pretty cool shield effect but based on this diagram you can kind of see the client wanted just a nice curve at the top of his shield so if I extend this outwards And then we'll add one more point here, and then remove this one. Add that one back. Oops. Where's this little thing? How did you get there? <laughs> Stray points. <laughs> Gotta love them. Don't need that one either. Alright. And now we are ready to reflect this. So, I'm just gonna 
duplicate it by holding down the command tab and just hitting one of the arrow keys or just dragging actually or not if you have the shape selected and then you try to shift drag it works a lot better <laughs> And we're going to drag this point. And whenever you're working with vectors, it's really important that your points do actually touch. And the way you affirm if they do or don't is this black arrow will shift to white if, you're, if you connect. And that's good. We made the connection. And then we're going to zoom in here. And then using, there's two primary selection tools in um, Illustrator, there's the black arrow V keybind, and then there's the white arrow the A keybind. This one is selecting objects, and this one is for selecting the points associated with those objects. So we're going to use this white one right here. Select both of the points associated with both of these objects, and then we're going to join them. And then we're going to do the same for the nave. You can see they're kind of off, you know? And if you have something like this and you try to use join, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But um, one way to match them up quickly is doing average and both. And that'll bring them pretty close together. And then join. All right. So now that we got the base shape down, we can use this to produce the inner layer. So we're going to duplicate that one. Whenever uh, I'm duplicating things in Illustrator, I really like to, like, I don't just like to drag it out over here, because I like to keep things lined up. Like, I just duplicated this, but the duplicate is actually, like, perfectly in line with the original one. And the way you go about doing that is use one of the modifier keys for motion. Uh, right now I'm using shift, and it's probably about 10 pixels, you know. Um, if you use control, it's a tiny, tiny increment. And control will also hide your bounding boxes, which is pretty nice. Um, and then when you're going to scale something, obviously we don't want this. Rather, we want that. And I'm holding down the, um, the option key for that effect. We got this point pretty good, but we kind of lost our corners over here. So I'm going to isolate this object. For the ability to quickly select both of these points, I can deselect it and then use my white selection tool to drag select both of these points and return them to their position. Let's see what's going on over here. We've got a little bit of a discrepancy. Probably don't need this point right here. So, um, yeah, it's it's pretty nice to actually get a uh, something from the client that's already at pretty decent. I mean, this is, this is nice, it's not decent, don't get me wrong. <laughs> and then for the cross in here, I'm just going to use the uh, M key for the box to make one of them. And then just to make sure that the next one I draw, because it's very tempting to just draw the next one out, but for vectors, you do, you do really want everything to be um, a similar size or a shim similar proportion, because if not, you'll start getting, as you start adding edges to this, there'll be weird things happening here in the corners and whatnot. So I'm going to do the same thing for this box. I just duplicated it to the side, and then I can move it back onto itself. 
and then as I'm rotating, holding down the shift key, we'll snap it to uh, 45, 90, and the zero degree axis. So selecting both of those forms, I can then use that Pathfinder tool. It's this one right here. If you wanted to know where it was, it's in the, to enable this men menu, it's up in the drop down under window Pathfinder. Um, I'm gonna unite these forms to cancel the center out. And now I've got a, just using vector lines, I've got a pretty good starting point for the, the main form. So whenever you're going about actually starting to work with, um, I mean, these are vector lines, but they're not, I kind of call vector form something that has both a stroke and a fill. And a pretty quick way to do that with any shape is just to select the whole thing and get your um, live paint bucket tool, which the key bind for it is K. And then obviously you want to be able to select a color, huh? So we'll just fill this guy in. Some colors. This is the general color scheme the client wanted. He wanted a, a red color similar to this one here. We'll just use that one. Um, and then around the edges, he wanted to complement it with a really light bluish silver. And I think we can work a lot from those colors. All right. So after something is uh, a light paint object, you'll notice like there's it's it's, it's a different type of object. Um, and you actually do need to collapse it because right now, like if I, I, I can't really grab this red space and just drag it out, you know? So what I need to do is um, expand this effect and uh, I'm pretty sure that it's gonna be under the tools. Under object, live paint, expand. It's also right here but I don't know. I typically prefer to use the one here. So after expanding it, uh, the one thing it does still do is it, it does keep it grouped, so you do need to ungroup it. Um, sometimes a couple of times. <laughs> and now I can actually select the different elements. Uh, and it does actually ungroup the lines from the forms, and that can be a nightmare, depending on how many shapes you got. So in general, whenever you're filling something in with the Life Paint Bucket tool, like use colors intelligibly, because one thing you can do is, like imagine th these were the same color. Um, let's fill this one in, right? But you had a whole bunch of other objects. Uh, you can just select one of those with this color and then go to um, select right here, same, fill color. And then it grabs all of those forms associated with this color. And then when you drag them out, you leave the lines behind. So that's a re it's, it's just a really good thing to know to keep things organized. Um, also, whenever you're selecting things like complementary colors, and I mean, we're about to jump into the whole color scheme. Uh, a really good tool for like quickly having a large palette of colors to work with is select the known color. In this case, they did want a kind of deep shade of red. Um, so we're gonna select this color, and then we're gonna go into our color guide, which is this guy. This can also be accessed from the window menu here. So using the color guide, um, make sure you, when you click this, it affirms the color you have as your swatch color down here as the, the color it's going to set all these menus to. Like if I click this yellow one and open the color guide, it's still here.
So it's generally a pretty good idea to take uh, from the color guide. You definitely want to get get the complementary set of colors. That's a really important kind of range of tones for blending. So I'm going to drag this, or just click it, and it throws it down here in my swatches. Complements. Uh, monochromatic is definitely a plus. It gives you tints and shades. And then I would say definitely go for some high contrast. Get some more blues in there. Um, so The secondary color we're going to use, uh, the blue I kind of just randomly selected earlier, this is actually, using the color guide, it's a really good way to, I mean, you can call it, you're not having to think about it, but I mean, you're intelligibly saying, oh, hey, this blue is its complement, you know? So not only does it go with it, but it actually blends with it too. So we're going to use this blue here. We'll drag this and add it next to our other. So these colors right here will be our primary colors for the logo. Um, let's see, let's go with a little bit smaller here. Got a huge list. Uh, we also want to grab some of this color's tones and shades. So go with monochromatic, add that one. Wow, it's weird. I do not want that, I want the whole thing. Maybe one of these will be, yeah. There we go. Those are a little bit deeper. And this one too, it's pretty bad. Let's go back and get a pretty good range of tints and shades. All right. So that looks pretty good. Now, um, when you're looking at any object, I mean, there's some amount of kind of innate knowing of its form. Um, and for our shield specifically, we're definitely going to want, like, uh, I mean, it's a two dimensional object, but we know shields do uh, tend to bend outwards like that. And to some degree, we can produce that from this straight on effect using uh, color gradients. Um, so that'll be the first thing I want to do. And so I'll duplicate this one. Um, and this is where gradients and color blending come in. Like this is the base form, but I can actually produce more like, I guess, perceptual form, not using lines and edges, but actually just using um, color gradient and blending. So that's what we're going to do. Let's pull up our menus here. This is your gradient menu, your best friend. Um, it is also accessed in the Windows gradient option. So I'm just going to establish a light source from above the shield. So I know I'm going to want a delineation of light like brighter towards the top, deeper towards the bottom, and to some degree I can produce that effect using um, gradients. So let's, oops, where'd our color go? Let's drag this color. This on the very edge here. And then we'll use, you know, this this menu is pretty nice, but Illustrator actually has a pretty sweet gradient tool now. You select it, and then you just, oh wow. Okay, so whenever this happens, right, like, you got to form, click the gradient tool, you're all like, where's my gradient? I don't know if it's a bug, but it's just really annoying. You actually have to change the type of swatch 
your form is, like this is a form, but it's a colored form. And what it actually needs to be is a gradient form. And so I toggle it by pressing this button here. And now whenever you use the gradient tool, it actually listens to your intentions, right? Um, so working from there, intuitively, like, it would make sense to do something linear, you know, just like shades of dark to lighter shades here and there. But if we want to make kind of the bow of the shield effect, we can actually achieve that using a, a radial gradient. I mean, this is obviously way too much. This is like a bowl of a shield, you know. But um, we can extend it outwards and then draw this ellip point inwards, probably a bit more. I do want to make a nice crest down the center of the shield, um, so I'll throw some colors in there to reflect that desire. Uh, let's see, let's get some of that. And just, I'm, I'm going to look for a hard edge right off the get-go for the very center of the shield, so I'm just going to throw in a high contrast green. Um, and then some, uh, oops, let me see, maybe a lighter shade of red after it. And then we'll return to our base color and maybe have like a bit more shade. Another way of like quickly producing colors is in this gradient window, if you click in between any two colors like such, you produce a color relative to where you clicked. Like clicking here would be a light pink versus clicking here would be a pinker dark red. Okay? Um, and that is how we go about doing that. I want to make this edge really defined right here. And you notice how I, I'm kind of ramping up to this red with a, a deeper shade of, sorry, ramping up to the screen with a deeper shade of red. Um, and whenever you put a highlight in between two darker colors, it's generally a good idea to, um, oops, to extend its, this is kind of its sphere of influence. like. Usually, whenever you have a gradient, um, it's a gradient is much like a vector. It's two points, and then, all right, sorry, it's it takes three, just as it takes three points to make a vector, um, gradients also are associated with kind of a three tangent system. So you have your color, color, and then your curve, right? So I'm going to extend the the uh, the center curve point closer towards the deep edge to reduce that harsh harsh red edge there. And do the same for that. And then over here This one out a bit. All right. Now, one thing that we need to think about is the curve of our gradient is actually going to be on the edge. Like this is kind of what I was going for, right? So uh, the two things we need to do is completely rotate this thing, um, and then also work on this center high contrast edge. So I'm gonna, it's, it's not a matter of changing the, I mean it is, but the most important thing about this kind of intent is you need a really massive gradient. So let's, so now we're starting to actually get a much, a much kind of like, it's, it, it appears like it's pretty, it appears like a linear gradient, but um, it's got a subtle curve to it which really does help influence the, um, the perception of dimension, you know? I mean, it's, it's very much a flat graphic, you know? Just by adding, like, a non-linear uh, curved gradient, we do kind of accent on that. Um, and then once you're gradient, the, the main kind of, I would call this, elliptoid right here, this um, this is the shape of the gradient, right? 
or uh, it's kind of like the gradients form, you know. But uh, once you got that established, I would really zoom in and start fine tuning where you're putting your edges in terms of color. Because we are, we're, we're not using lines to make these shapes. We're just using uh, the contour of modulating colors. So there's a pretty large de degree of finesse you can approach this with. Um, and let's, let's put a little bit more shine on our shield. You never really want absolute white in any of your vectors if you're going to be blending because um, it just, I mean, white is like an absolute value. So in blending, which use mathematical, mathematical formulas, it tends to stick out and kind of disturb things. So we're going to look for a pink kind of not quite right, but a little bit of red. So right now you might be wondering, yeah, you you use the green to make sure you can find that edge, but are you really going to leave that green in there? And to that question, I would say yes. Not only is green associated with um, being the complement of red, but when, whenever you're color blending, sometimes it's not about what color visually appears like. It's about how color um, blends with another one. You know, and there's many different ways of blending color. So, uh, point case, I'm going to duplicate the original red. This is, this will, we'll establish this color in this form as our very bottom level shape, right? Um, and to organize your layers or to organize your, um, what's on top of what, it's under the right click arrange and then you would just send it to back, right? So now, now whenever you grab this shape and line it up with that one, you can start blending. So let's select this shape, and all the color blending modes are in the transparency window, and that also can be accessed from the top text menu bar. It's under window transparency. Um, so that said, there's a lot of different options. Color blending isn't this rational linear thing, you know. There you can you can achieve the same effect using very many different approaches. Um, like for example, right now the brightest color on the shield is actually green, you know? Like it's it stands out. It's extremely it's and, it, and it's that bright because you have so much red around it, you know? Like even though there's a, a stream of white here, I mean, yeah, you could say by extension there is less white, but the reality is, is um, whenever you put two complementary color colors next to each other, they actually kind of activate and like make each other vibrate. It's only when you mix them uh, that they cancel each other out. You know, in pigments they yield kind of muddy grays, browns, and with light they kind of reach white shades of gray. Um, but that said, um, let's select the top layer, and uh, whenever you want to have kind of the, not not the chromatic quality of a gradient, but rather its degree of brilliance, you definitely want to use the luminosity filter, right? And so what that did was it said, okay, for the gradient form on the top, I want you to apply your intensity to the form on the bottom, right? And as you can see, I, I like using a gray background because it's a very, like when you're not aligning shapes, it's a pretty good way of um, like s seeing kind of what your blend might turn into. And it does kind of, this, this gradient I set up kind of mimics the effect of um, like the metallic curve of the shield. Um, so we'll line that one back up. Um, I'm going to do another one. This time, like, 
if this gradient really established the kind of main sheen, the glamour of the center of the shield, I do want to actually like touch on the edges of the shield. You know, I want to give it like a, a curved effect. I want to make it look round because right now it kind of, I mean, it looks curved, but only in the center. So um, I can go about doing that using another gradient. I'm going to switch its um, blending mode back to normal so it can really understand what I'm doing. Um, and for this one, um, here, we're going to need a really large amount of space. So I'm going to hit G to get my gradient tool out. I'm going to actually center this towards the interior of the shield. And then we're going to use kind of the radial bow of this gradient to make the outer curves. Let's, see. Let's drag some of these higher contrast colors out of here so we just get an idea about what's happening here. So you see how, based on where I put this very elongated ellipse, I can I can kind of make the like if I put it here, I don't I don't quite um, achieve the effect. And also, let's pull that other dark one out. But by placing it in the center, actually get a nice um, transition from darker color to a brighter center. You know. It's, this one looks like it really emphasizes the um, the shadow property of the shield's curves. Um, and I can actually develop that a bit more. Whenever you're working with shadows, um, whereas with the highlight, I used red's complement green as a kind of rival, extremely high contrast, vibrating color. With shadows, you don't necessarily want to do that. You want to use like um, a subtler shift of our, a, a smaller modulation of color. And uh, for that, we'll just, we'll actually, I mean, it's good to make it darker, but it's better, it's better to make it cooler whenever you're blending. And when I mean cooler, I mean like literally like cool down the color. Like let's go for something like a little bit purple, you know? Not, I mean, that's obviously a bright purple, but um, we can extract some uh, like lighter colors here. Um, and so, what I think I'm going to do is have this guy down here. Yeah, whenever you can't quite, like, I'm, I'm trying to get this this purple down to the bottom, but it's not reaching. It just means that your your gradient form is a bit too small, you know? It's, it's a tedious balancing. So place there, I get a nice slight curve there, you know? And it gives it the effect of the shield curving inward. Um, however, let's develop the, uh, the main curve a little bit more. You know, this, this is not round enough. <laughs> I wanted a really long, elong elongated gradient for the center curve of the shield, but for these kind of outer shadows, I'm actually going to draw it in a bit more to get a bit more curve going. And then, oops, ah. stretch this guy back out. There we go. See now, like. Just looking up here at the top, we're getting a, a nicer, smoother curve. Um, and we need to kind of establish that effect also on the bottom. That purple might be a little bit too intense.
But overall, that's looking pretty good. I might even go as far as to say, um, make the whole thing a little bit, um, a little bit more purple. Let's see. I actually really prefer HSB whenever I'm just kind of tinkering with colors. Um, it just makes sense, you know. This one down here is like, this is the color and then this is just black. The same thing is true for the center. This is white and this is the color. And up here it's, which color do I want to get? So HSB is really good just for setting up the, uh, the luminosity or the intensity of the color you want, you know. So that's looking overall pretty good. I would say the only thing that looks a little bit weird is like the discrepancy between this sharp edge and my kind of kinked in curves. Um, and what I might actually do is I've, I've been working with this thing kind of centered in the shield, but if I drag it a little bit more to the right, the um, <clears throat> I can actually get these gradients to bend a bit more. Let me get that color out of there. Oh, this song is awful. Hold on a second. Alright. <clears throat> Expand this a little bit more. <clears throat> Alright. But overall, that's pretty good. So let's bring this guy back in with all his other buddies. <clears throat> probably generally a good idea to keep tabs on what you're making in terms of layers, you know. Um, so let's, whenever you go about blending multiple of the same shape, with just two you can be pretty, pretty creative in how you go about getting the effects, like ooh, let me like slide the like on the top one. Let me slide this opacity around and get like a less or a more intense effect, you know. But um, it's better to do really precise, fully opaque blends. Just like say if you if you ever need to modify the shape, you can just use these as swatches, you know. Like um, it's hard to edit the contents of each one of these layers simultaneously, but it's easier to just go to the base layer, you know, and, uh, oops, go to the base layer and change one thing, you know, and then have all of your, um, oh wow, that's pretty awful. Yeah, it's actually not a very simple process, but where I was going with this is, if you can, try to be very intentional, like, play around with these, learn what they do, you know, um, but make it use as least amount of layers as you can while still using like multiple gradients to make a pretty cool effect. Um, so I'm going to add this one. Dang it. I'm going to move this one over here. Oops. There's probably many different filters that I could uh, play around with to apply kind of the the smoothness and the curve the curved quality of this purple layer but um hard light is one that definitely will work for me see i've got the actually no that one's pretty It does do a pretty good job of, I think that these little guys that I set up aren't, aren't quite making a leap out there yet, like they're not quite with this hard light filter influencing the overall effect of the shield. Um, but that's something that even in this blend, if you, um, if you don't see, you, you might actually kind of activate it or stimulate it later on like 
this gradient vector knows there's pixels right here that are a little bit darker than the pixels d down here. And um, to some degree, you can actually, with later blends, kind of accentuate that property right here. Um, hokey pokey. Uh, the next thing I want to do is kind of work with the... This looks kind of strange because it's only curved upward. And it's also a wee bit kind of... It's, it's not bland, it's just not dynamic yet, you know? Like if we go back to the, um, <coughs> the reference image of our mouse... Where's he at? Oh, I think I hit it. Ah. There's, there's always a lot going on with realistic depictions of chrome-like things. And, uh, I mean, you don't need to make a billion layers of gradients, but, you know, you do want to, like, kind of do things like these, or these little white parts are, you see this gradient right here, this uh, brighter white edge, that's something that I think we really need to establish as um, a predominant feature in the shield. So let's duplicate this form once more. Um, and I'm actually going to chop this thing in half. But before I do that, I'm going to do that using uh, another form, another shape completely. Um, if our main reflection kind of bows outwards, our... Here, I'll draw for you. Our main kind of metallic reflection is going this way, but uh, if we have another one that goes that way, it will it'll really kind of bring out the, the depth of the shield, like right here, oops, um, if we had another gradient here, right at the intersection of these two curves, you'll get a really sweet looking polished shadow. Um, and that's what we're going to try to achieve here. Um, so, I'm actually going to put this down. No, that was right. And blend modes are also pretty good for just, like, whenever you're working with multiple overlaid shapes, you know? Um, like, probably any one of these tells you the information of both objects you're looking at, you know? Um, I mean, some of them do it a little better than others, so it's just a matter of, like, playing around with them and learning. So I'm going to select this point and bring it downwards a bit. And then I'm going to use my uh, Converter Anchor Point tool, Shift-C. It's in the same menu as the pen tool. To click and then drag. This, this applies curves to a place where there weren't curves before. So as I draw this outwards, I make more of a bowed line. As I draw it inwards, it makes more of a kind of point, 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 cur or point, 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 linear delineation of edge. So something probably right out there is pretty good, you know. Um, and then selecting both of these forms with our Pathfinder, um, I want to do the minus front option, and what that does is it just, it takes the the front form you created, and I mean you intended this one, like to, like I wanted this curve of this form to essentially slice this one in half, and that's how you do that effect, you know, because that way of working is way more efficient than going, oh, you know, like, I need to modify this thing, so let's uh, select some anchor points, and, uh, like, I mean, so, like, stuff like this, like, you have an inner shape, you know, it's just a whole thing that you can avoid entirely, just using another form with the intent to, um, 
use your little butter. The Pathfinder is a shit. Like it is it is what makes vectors unique and their the simplicity and the ease at which you produce them. Um, all right, getting off topic a little bit. Let's uh, hop back onto what we are trying to do, and that is we want to make this kind of stand out a lot more. It's and right now it's also purple, you know. So um, it's really this like. It's not even cold anymore. Like I was going for a cold color, but it definitely like when when you blend the cold with this kind of sterile dark red, kind of <laughs> makes a really exciting color purple. Um, so the way we'd go about reducing that is we definitely want to use a complement of red. Um, I mean, we do want to use a little bit of red, and also it'd probably be safe to do a linear gradient for this one. It's not a very complex uh, vector form. We'll we'll pull from the uh, monochromatic color list of our original red color, a, a little bit brighter of a red color, um, and then uh, <coughs> we need to get a bright complementary green in there. And then these colors are going to. I want this to fade, so I'm gonna reduce the opacity of that guy. Um, it's also, I need to work on the direction of my gradient. I want to go extend outwards like such. Um, let's bring this down to about there. And let's pull this. Remember in the, uh, just as I, I was talking earlier how um, Gradients are much like vectors in that they are delineated by kind of a three value system, color, color, and then central curve point. I'm gonna pull this curve point down a bit to make a more dramatic um, kind of flare of light happen here. And I mean, just looking at this, whenever you get something, whenever you see like a band in a gradient, it's probably not. It's it's probably gonna blend like that too, and that's something you definitely early on want to establish on getting rid of, and also like this odd transition of color here. Um, you can cure stuff like this by just it's 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 a lot of color theory, but just like oh this this is a a bright green color. It's pretty warm. This red is, I mean, it's also a warm color, but it's also a lot of red. So maybe if I use something with a little bit more yellow, but not quite red, which would be orange, I might get a, a bit of a softer, softer transition. Um, but you see how that muted it? So you still need some like intensity down there. So we'll, we'll put a little bit of like a little band of red light here. And we'll set it up nicely. Because whenever you're making really um, like glossy, white, shiny reflections, it's actually really good to set it up not with uh, shades of gray to white, but using extremely high contrast colors. Because um, your eye will start to pick out a lot of things like this. And also, I mean, like, you can see the difference that this one uh, swatch makes, you know? like. I'll zoom in so you could see it a little bit better. You see that? Like it's it's all the little stuff like that that really start to accent and like vivify vector forms, you know? And not so much like the uh, how good are you at like making curves and whatnot, you know? Um, so color is actually very color gradients and blending modes are a very 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 important aspect of making like very minimal like least amount of point possible but also complex like kind of dimensional looking forms um, I do want to get rid of this gray one I jump back to this um, I have two options I can either reduce its opacity opacity sorry um, and I might even like take the second option too which is shift its hue kind of away from uh, this kind of neon, like exuberating green, maybe a close, a bit closer towards yellow, something kind of around there. Also playing with the uh, 
the vector point and the gradient might help you establish uh, a smoother transition of color. So overall, that looks pretty good. Um, I would say the only thing I might have lost is the... I was, I was going for a really intense like base right here, but I might have lost a bit of that. Let's see. It's something you can also work out with this tool. I mean, this tool is like the gradient tool hitting G. This is also a really clutch way of establishing where it is that your gradient begins to make transitions. Um, so that looks pretty sick. Um, oh, never mind. This this green screen is still very problematically. We'll go with that one. So let's blend this bad boy. Oops. Remember, aligning is very important because you don't want to be like, oops, you know? Ooh, what's that? Weird, weird edge. See? Speaking of aligning, I definitely. I didn't. I didn't nick. Um, I didn't nick my shield that way. Rather, what I did was that, that curve that I used to slice out, the curve wasn't actually aligned with the very corner of the shield. Um, but that may or may not be something I need to look into. Dang it. Look into correcting. Weird. Yeah, this, I think that, that whenever whenever you're aligning something using points, like, there tends to be, like, a bug or something. And I think it has to do with the the resolution you're working with, your vector. Like, for some reason, the, uh, the vector point grid system is only allowing this form to exist here or here, you know? I, there's, for whatever reason, there's no amount of incremental work that I can use to line them up and that's a really big issue and um, the way you justify that um, <clears throat> actually here I'll, I'll finish this thought real quick um, I'll show you the blend I was in we'll go with the screen screen really it takes the top color um, or it takes the top form which is the screen one and it tells kind of like use all of these bright colors and none of the dark ones to livy up anything going on below it, you know? And so let's see what we get doing that. And notice how we're now back to just like, it. it's not a purely red shield, but overall I would say the shield is red, you know? There's a lot of kind of subtle shifts in color happening throughout the shield that, um, like where they might seem like they're, the quality of it is like, ooh, why do you have like, like what's going on in here? Like I think overall, like when your eye sees it as a whole, it amounts to, or the shift in color modulation just amounts to like a richer, um, a bit nicer of a tone, you know? Um, but we can fine tune that and I'll show you how to do that in one sec. But uh, to fix this problem, what we actually need to do is increase the size of all of our vector forms um, I don't want to, like, to fix the form, the thing, what you actually need to do is take this, increase its size, and now, um, oops, the vectors can align in the vector grid more correctly. See, now I'm not having that problem anymore. But you never want to just do that like I just did, because oh shit, like where's all our, like I need to put this cross back in here and I just like randomly scaled it. How do I, like, it's just a pain to like remember, you know? So um, if you ever run into that problem, do you think about scaling all of your forms in unison? All right. So we'll go back down here and correct this. Um, 
Another thing I want to talk about and highlight the importance of, like, there's nothing you remember. I mean, obviously you might remember something. But the most important thing about this process of uh, color blending is the way I was just doing it. Like, I mean, it seemed like I had the intuitive knowledge of what the result would be, but that's, that's not the reality. That's not actually how I do it. I was just, like, bringing them out here and showing you like delineating, oh, like we're making more of the same form, different types of kind of plays of shadows and like highlights and then like really bright whites, you know? But um, the way you actually fine tune color using these blending modes is, um, I mean, just play with them. Like, it's not like the blending mode is gonna turn off. So go over here and you little, like move it around, you know, see, see kind of what types of effects you can make further like, See how shifting the color changes the overall like, outcome of the blend, you know? Because the outcome, remember, it's established by the blending of four different shapes. And if I changed one color here, it actually is like a, a multiplying effect, you know? It changes a lot of them very quickly. Oh. <laughs> okay, you see how I'm like, oh, never mind, I am getting it. For some reason, I thought I wasn't. I didn't have the object selected, but I do. Um, so if, I think if I go too much this way, I get that weird pink, you know. But I do like the um, like. We are looking at it with the intent to like really set it up, but I think that it's it's kind of it's kind of like the property of art, you know, where like you look at your own art very very critically, but others just subjectively perceive it and that's one thing you have to remember you know like you you can work that aspect to your advantage uh, like you can use like the complementary green color blended over the red and produce like more natural colors that aren't like oh let's um here like basically what i'm trying to argue is that um let me grab these out here oops actually like it would seem very intuitive to take a form like this um, and approach it with the um, kind of grayscale mentality, you know, like, oh, these are the shifts in light I need, and then uh, let's blend this with the original one. But I think there's, like, Technically, a big issue with that is, like, first of all, when you're blending things with, like, these are all formulas, right? But whenever you're blending things with formulas, and you're giving it, um, completely linear values, I mean, just think about, like, not in terms of color perceptually, but color, um, as, like, three-point RGB vectors, if these are all the same value, you're, like, your blending is going to be pretty... I mean, you're, you're going to know it's going to change, but it's also limited by that. Like, it's the difference between, like, a two-dimensional plane and a three-dimensional plane, you know? Like, by nature of the fact that the entire RGB, uh, like, anything that's gray is going to have the same exact RGB values, you know? And as you see me drag up and down, like, it goes from 0 to 225 white, you know? And I think that, like, whenever you're blending, it just doesn't, like, it doesn't always produce kind of what you're looking for. Like, you'll get, like, really corny stuff, like, that is really fucking corny, you know? Um, or it's just really hard to get what you want. Like, you really start to see where the lines of the gradient are, you know, versus, like, smoothly blending it out. And in this one, like, I don't even say it's, like, quite there yet. Like, I think this green color needs a bit of a hand. Yeah, green and red are complements where you, they, they mix towards white, but before they get there, there's like a very many interesting shades of kind of chromish yellow. It's kind of like if you, if you took the, the copper sheen and applied the exuberance of gold to it, that's kind of where red and green like, 
that's where they that's where they really begin to become perceptually interesting. You know. Um, Notice how when I, like, just taking the green out of this, like, this is way shinier, but I think this is too much yellow, um, right now. So, I mean, you can try, like, toggling these color sliders around a lot, but it's honest just a best, it's, the best way of doing this is just to find the correct kind of sheen you want. Um, Like you see, if it's down here, I get I get that weird kind of pinkish red color. Whereas like I can extend it, and you you can really start to see its uh, its sphere of influence, if you will, um, kind of smooth out the uh, like I'm seeing this shadow through this light, and that's a pretty cool effect and something you want to really think about when you're working on stuff like this. But to bring it back down to the red, you can kind of play with it. It's opacity. Uh, one second. might be the problem. Um, sometimes you gotta go back a bit. I think that the uh, the purple we used here it might be the culprit. So what you can do is um, oops. I definitely missed To work on, uh, or to kind of change the color of previous layers. I mean, you could use the layers window and organize them that way, but it's really, I don't know, it just seems like a lot more work. I just um, pull down shift and kind of nudge it the other direction, and then uh, you can get in real close and select the color you need. And whenever you select the, whenever you select any vector form that has a gradient, like do remember the last gradient you played with is still kind of in the limelight of things. So to go back into editing this gradient, you wanna over here in your toolbar click the actual gradient swatch, you know, and play with it. Um, oops. Where did our colors go? So, working with this one, I think we can kind of bring down this yellow. Like, we like its intensity, but we want a red shield, you know? And I think that the answer to that um, is going to be in one of these earlier purple colors, you know? Um, maybe dragging your red closer, or dragging your blue down is probably... No, it's the opposite. See, now we're, we're getting a really cool, like, it's not a white color, but it, it mimics the effect of white. Like, it looks very, it just looks like a, like a glowing red, um, here at least. I'm not sure why this down here is another story. Oh, that's why. I'm going to recenter this. I'm moving my oval gradient back towards the center. Remember, this is what's making the, uh, the shadows down here on the edge. See how just extending that purple out is making the shield as a whole a, a bit more close to the red spectrum. Okay. Hmm.
Oops. RGB is your friend. <laughs> That's activating the green of our uh, our primary glossy white reflection. This is tuning. It's extremely subjective in that, like, you really need to, like, this is where a really in good eye changes, like, the difference between a really, really awesome vector and a pretty freaking cool one, you know? Like, you can, just, just playing around with these is really what makes, uh, Playing around with these and playing around with blends is really what starts to make uh, your vector graphics pop more, you know? Like, I, I like the kind of philosophy of, like, simple... I mean, given the shape you have, produce it with the least amount of points possible, and then further, like, use color where color can actually produce the effects you need, you know? like. Color alone is what makes this flat kind of red shape actually st start to look more like a, a bulwark of sort, bull shield, and a bulwark, a shield. <laughs> Yeah, this corner is extremely problematic. I should have removed it a while ago, but for some reason I like it. Okay, now going back to a green color. You're just kind of sliding it about. Um, and before I continue, because it's really, because it's really important to know this. Like, these are vectors, and they're also, I mean, the effect of this curve is produced solely by gradients and solely by stacked vectors. Vectors, and this is something that before you leave Illustrator, you have to kind of resolve into not a bunch of different shapes. You know. Um, and the way you go about doing that is selecting all of them and then going to um, object and then Latin transparency. I would go for a lot of G's. Do, you, do, you, de you definitely want to preview it. Because often you will get stuff like that. And that might be because you're trying to use too many vectors. might also be the color space you're in. And also these could just be artifacts of being so zoomed out. There's a lot of like, hold on. Let's, let's zoom back in here and really look at this thing. Yeah, so those weird edges were just a product of being too far zoomed out and um, not so much like kind of the toggling of this. But that'll, that'll, I mean, you can tell these weren't completely aligned per se. Oops, where's my zoom? Like, I definitely need to work on the alignment of them there. But now this is, um, this is all one object. Or I thought it was. It should be. 
I think when you click into it, you can still move things about, but it certainly reduces them. And clicking in here, this is where you would go to just like remove, like you never even want those. That was like completely my error right there. Like that's, that's awful. It's kind of like scrubbish that I, that that happened. Um, but that is the general idea. I'm gonna hop over to um, uh, another one of my documents where I have, um, I'm not going to create a bunch more forms, I'm going to show you some existing ones and just talk about them a bit more so I can spend more time discussing the process and less time actually like trying to do it before you, you know, it's a, it's a whole thing. So it's, uh, what is my... Go to the other document button. I think it is. Window. Red shield paths. Ooh, that's bright. I'm sorry. <laughs> I made this diagram uh, to, d and this is the original one I made, and obviously you can tell I spent a lot more time. Uh, making sure all the color layers were balanced. Um, let me hide this. Actually, I'll hide the bar up there too. There we go. Um, this one is still a grouped object, so if I were to ungroup it, I could actually play around with the portions, like this inside of the full grouped one. I also group all of my blends together, so if I were to ungroup this one, only then would I begin to start dragging out all of those shapes. Yeah. I went with, I think, a brighter orange here on this original one. Um, and then this is the flattened version, and the main difference between uh, a vector that's been flattened and one that hasn't is its ability to transfer into other programs. Like if I copied this, for example, uh, man, gone are the days where you can right click copy. All right, keep on. Let's take this guy into Photoshop. Uh, layer. Ooh. And paste it and you'll probably see we'll sometimes it works out and it looks like it did in this case which is kind of amazing but um a lot of times you might get artifacts of a non artifacts that will appear which are caused by not flattening your uh, your vector forms I think an earlier version of this shield I tried to paste it in and it was definitely definitely not working out very well. Um, this is a reiteration of the the shields. I mean, we, these look familiar. This is the base one. Um, this is the, the metallic sheen. And here I have kind of like what part of the shield and the type of blend mode they have. Um, but I want to talk more about kind of how creative you can be. Um, for example, Look at this shape. It's kind of strange looking because it it has a ton of colors. Um, but the modulation of this gradient, right? If I use kind of the shifting intensity of these colors, like something my eye can easily make, like oh, I can make a, a bunch of different vibrant shifts in color, you know? Then I can use blending modes to apply this shifting luminosity onto um, the kind of base color I have and that form I just showed you is the um, kind of the inner shelf of the shield it's this thing right here so you can actually see a bit where there's a bit more purple a bit more yellow a bit more white you know but uh, when you actually zoom out it kind of just resolves into like a nice little sheen or a gleam or a glitter right there, you know, and um, it's kind of like the 
the modulation of colors that really brings that out, or in this, um, in the light blue outer edge of the shield, um, like it, it looks pretty crisp, right? But um, a lot of the things which produce its very sparkly quality, you begin to notice as you zoom in, uh, like stuff like this. What is that? Um, oops. Let's get back. As you can see here, what I've actually got going is, um, again, multiple of the same. I have the, the base form, which discusses kind of the primary play of light. Like I got, I reiterated that central line here. And then I've got my um, darks, lights, um, next to it I have a stroke which kind of gives it the kind of clean cut metal accent and then these these what, what, what's going on here you're probably like why, why do you have little rainbows all over the place and I have, I have little rainbows because whenever you you blend these with the blue you know you can start to make Kind of like little glistenings of light like like yeah there is the smooth metal you know and then the darker the darker metal you know but then there's also kind of like the very rigid geometric property of metal that you can um iterate using like uh the excuse me you can iterate using a quick modulation of color like in this case i just did kind of like a a temperate shift. Um, if we go back to it, and we really get close, um, or we probably won't be able to get close enough. So I will just actually go into the object itself. Um, I've got gray, gray, and then like a bluish to a purple. Like a, a cold blue quickly heats up into a red, and then the red like shifts. To its complementary green, so this is a um, complementary contrast, and this is a cold warm contrast. So it just gives it a, a really to the eye, like it's even though you don't eventually see this, this kind of information of contrast color can be inscribed onto, um, oops, a baseline gradient color. Uh, so there's really, really no limit to like how exuberant or exotic you can get. Like you can use all kinds of colors, many kinds of colors, you know. And then just playing around with this menu, you can see how they interact. And it's, you can actually make a lot of really cool effects. For example, the, um, the interior of the shield where the cross is, um, it might be hard to see in this recording, but yeah, it's white. But uh, another property that it has to it is if we really get in close to you see like a really subtle shift of kind of, it's like a marbled glazed white effect, you know? And, and this is something that is with just using white gradients versus dark grays or lighter grays it's it's hard to authentically pull off a smooth like warm soft transition of color you know but it's it's something that's not quite hard just like starting starting with a lot you know and then re like reducing to a minimal like uh this was the kind of baseline shift of color i had and um it was actually the product of its own invert. Uh, if I was to invert it, I was working with colors and subtracting them towards like a really, because I know blue inverts into yellow. So I was going for like a really, like my eye can see more contrast in this than it can here. And so I was like, all right, let's, let's kind of keep this all a tone of blue, but get a lot of different shifts in color going on that's characterized by, you know, here we got like um, just contrast of saturation, you know, 
darker blue, paler blue, but in the center we have, um, oops, it's more of a simultaneous, like, the relationship between the amount of yellow to how much blue here results in this yellow actually coloring as more of like a, I mean, it's yellow, but it, it's suppressed, you know? And so um, when I'm inverting this, I get something that has a lot of, like, I mean, it is the product of many different gradients, but more so it's kind of the idea that I want to start with, you know? And then it's blending different types of colors. Like, ultimately, I'm trying to subtract all of this information, but have a little itty bit of it left, you know? And uh, that's where I went for the final blend of the shield, which is here. I think Photoshop. It looks pretty cool in Photoshop, too. Uh, yeah, so if I was to go into info and look at my RGB values, specifically RGB values, uh, you see how like each one of these is a completely unique color? And and that's that's really important for any form. You know, it's so easy in Illustrator to sit down and throw together a graphic with like uh, a two color gradient and like cross your hands and be done with it. But the thing is, is like, it just, one, it doesn't translate very well to raster. Like you get a lot of banding, you get a lot of strange effects. And two, like the eye naturally looks for subtle differences, you know, like you don't, you don't consciously say, oh, hey, there's like a ton of fluttering colors here Rather, you look at it and say, oh, like, it's kind of glossy looking, you know? It's the effect. You're going for, like, the perceptual effect of color. And that's something that, with Illustrator, you can, like, play with to extreme finesse. Um, let me see. Going back to it. I'm trying to think if there's a lot. Here's a uh, higher. Oh, if you want to talk about how do I make something look kind of, I mean, not, not 3D as in, oh, we're at a movie and we got 3D glasses on and I see two perspectives, but 3D as in the sense that it has a kind of a depth or like a quality of curvature to it, um, like this, this seam here. Uh, let me zoom out. Like you see how... It definitely looks like it, it, it looks round. It doesn't look like a, a square more so than it looks like this outer seam is definitely a bevel. Um, stuff like that is per, is possible using, um, or in this case specifically, I use, let's ungroup it. Ooh, that was probably not a good idea. I think it's already in groups. I used a base color gradient, right? So this one here, it's literally just, I'm pretty sure it's a two color gradient. Let me check. Yeah, white to gray, very simple, you know? And um, I mean, I said earlier, like, it's stuff like this that produces, like, uh, edgy, really. I mean, it, it's where you look at it and you're like, oh, that's a gradient, instead of looking at it and saying, oh, that's like a smooth transition of color, you know? And if you did want to use white and gray and not include any other colors, uh, a really, really, really sure way of re reducing the banding of gradients is to take your gradient, duplicate it, um, invert it, and I have this set to a keybind as Command-8, just because um, on Max, if you hold down Command-Option and Control, and then press 8, it mechanically inverts your entire screen. But in the program of Illustrator, if I wanted to invert something, um, the way you go about doing that is you select your object, you go to Edit, Edit Colors, Invert, right? And that's what I set the keybind to. So you invert your, um, invert your object, line it back up, 
and then um, when you overlay its invert, it has the effect of like flattening it, but also kind of giving it more of a, a smoother quality. It's like trying to do this, but it's faster doing it here. Like it's these are two colors, and I mean I can move these this around for ages, but it's really hard to reduce the the banding that happens just with this, but using uh, inverted duplicate overlaid with the original one, modifying the opacity can give me a very precise degree of control. And I mean, play around with the other blends, like, like stuff like this. Like, I had a two color linear gradient before where now it actually looks like more of a, a bar, right? And it's because it's, I mean, it is, it's the inverted one. So you can also make a lot of, like, forms that you would try to spend hours on, like, oh, I need to make this look like a pole, like, let's drag this in here, and the other side, you know, and try to make this look like a rounded pipe. I mean, that's, you can sit there all day trying to do that. Like, it was kind of what I was trying to do earlier with the shield, you know, um, but I mean, the same effect can be quickly achieved inverting and oops it's actually the other way around yeah there it is I mean I definitely by not centering it I definitely like did not get off to a good start with the whole banding issue but you get the idea um, so there's that that, that was one one property which makes like really tiny things actually a little bit more uh, curvy or resolvable. And the other thing is like even smaller, I can't even zoom that far. So I've got a, or maybe I can. Let me see, nope. I reduce the size of my document before I send it off. Um, so let's look at this thing. Because this is like, conceptually, I would say this is probably, I mean, it's, it's a good thing to conclude on when you're talking about um, using color to denote contour, you know, and inside of a program that's so associated with like shapes and edges, you know, and the interplay between the two. Um, but yeah, a lot of that is, like, even before you start trying to draw things, a lot of that happens in color first. Um, so let's look at what's going on here. This is another case, I believe, of having a... Oops. Let me delete that. Go away. I think I lost one of my shapes. This is not... Weird. I think I might have deleted it when I was making this diagram, so let me go back to. Ah, here we go. Oops. One second. Okay. Yeah, these pieces. Oh, is this my flight in the wind? I think I'm just going about this all... Yeah, I flattened this one, so I actually lost all the the information about its colored gradients. Um, so, I will go... This is probably the only vector form in this entire document that has retained the information I'm looking for. This is what I was trying to get to. Sorry for taking so long. Here's another inverted um, 
blending filter. I mean, it, it was the same one I was discussing earlier. But that's what constitutes the center. But if we started to look at just this little guy right here, the degree at which it appears really metallic, like look at these corners. I wish I could here, let me make this a bit larger. I'm sure it's probably hard to see on the camera. There we go. Whenever you start talking about things like this, this becomes possible by using not just light dark contrast, but actual um, color contrast. Like you've probably noticed before, like if you look at the edge of a shadow, sometimes um, the shadow will have kind of like a redder side or a bluer side or um, it's kind of like um, the colors in a sunset or a sunrise, you know, like uh, on the, if, if this was the sun, oh, that is definitely, definitely not going to be our sun in this, in this explanation of color concepts. That'll be our sun. Um, if you got a sun, oops. It's peeking up over the horizon, you know. When you're talking about the transition of color and shadows, what you'll definitely see is, I mean, closest to it, are, it's going to be um, your most intense reds, you know. And eventually, if after they pass through the orange and the yellow, or yellows here, spectrum, like, it might cool off to... You might see some pretty cool purples there too, um, but that is when you are directly looking towards the object of the sun. All right, I'm not going to sketch this. This is ridiculous. I'm sorry. Um, all I'm trying to say is that on the boundary of a shadow, which is synonymous with saying on the boundary of a highlight, there's always a little interaction of color, you know? And those are things you can use in vector gradients to imply form. Like uh, these kind of metallic bars here, we're so zoomed in it's very easy to see their, what they, they are produced by. But this is the gradient of them here. And I have, in the, mostly predominantly in the center, which is from here to here, I have this gray color. And then I have them transition to white and then there's a, a green and a red, you know? And I use green and red because, I mean, they're complements, but when they are in slight amounts and from an optically far resolution, they actually color more as like a kind of shiny yellow effect. It was similar to the sheen on the shield I was playing with earlier. And um, let me see. And the other document, red and green are complements, but um, when you're talking about how they mix in light, you do start to kind of make some really interesting shades of kind of yellowish, reddish green. Um, and it's kind of playing with those, you know, it's playing with them on the edges of things. Um, conversely, uh, magenta and blue when they're really close together. Basically, you get the intensity of blue, but the kind of hue of violet. It's kind of like looking uh, in the middle of the day when the sun is directly above you. If you look off, not at the horizon, but a little bit higher, you see that very, very atmospheric blue color, you know? And, and that color is also characteristically part of the boundary of a light and dark contour. So 
I mean, you don't you don't have to know like exactly how color works per se, because that's such a silly notion. You know, it's it's always relative. You know, but I think if there's anything I can stress the importance of, it's just using colors and not just tonal gradations or not like these kind of like uh, two bit. Uh, let's just throw that one on. Oh, that's. That looks like a pretty gradient, you know? It's not just doing stuff like this, you know? Because there's, there's, not only is this like a band of shifting RGB values versus what I was doing with um, using, you know, just something a little bit different. Like, maybe I want this side darker, so I'm gonna put above it, not that color, a darker, like this dark red. And then I want this side a little bit more rich. Like, these are completely the wrong colors, but that doesn't matter because I'm just using the intensity of them, you know, um, to modify my blue. And you see how just doing that alone, I get a much more rich gradient. Or, I mean, just kind of clicking through these things. You can make really soft transition of colors, and more so whenever the gradient changes. Because, like, I, I have the same band of colors, so it's like if I... If you imagined it as rows of pixels that were completely lined up, I just put another row in front of it, where I can actually, just by slightly throwing off the balance of the blend color, like get a much smoother effect, you know? Um, now it's like, it's the difference between having like a, an array of these guys, right? Like if, if this right here, this represents the shifting colors in a gradient, to put a blend on top of them is just to like have these red, you know? Where are they at? Ah. Damn, these need to be boxes. I don't know why it was going about doing this with So if this is like, if this is what constitutes your gradient, and you do want to blend it with like, um, oops, okay, so I'm using a Mac keyboard, I'm not very familiar with it, um, and you do want to blend it with another color gradient, lining them up precisely, you're d what's going to happen is this, whereas all I'm saying is, like, do a little bit of this, you know, do a little bit of that, because now what you get when you do actually uh, start to blend things is um, like rows of RGB pixels kind of like sp talking a little bit differently to themselves and it's it's analogous to the um, zoom. it's analogous to the scenario right where this gradient is longer than this one and so just by just by that difference, they'll blend a little bit better, right? Because there's the, the the vector of the color gradient and the vector of the contour, the shape of it. Um, so yeah, those are, I guess, those are some things to think about, you know? Whenever you're working with like just primitive forms, lines, and colors. I mean, if anything, like, don't think of it as color. Just think of them as ratios, you know? And think of the quality or the quantity of the ratio as, like, oh, as I look over here, this is the brightest thing. Where it might be easy to say, this white is brighter. Well, this, this red is in a cluster of a bunch of other, or sorry, this green is in a cluster of a bunch of other colors. So it actually, by nature of its proximity to others, starts to really manifest to my eye as like the brightest object, you know? And that's, and, and it's not just because it's this color, because if we were to isolate it, like if we were to compare it with that color, like the white is definitely brighter. Like it's over here now. Wow, it, it lost. And the same is true if we put the white here and another dark color next to it, you know, 
that is now the brightest color. But the difference between this white being bright and um, this green being bright is its relationship with red. You know, it not not only is it like I I haven't even discussed this yellow because this yellow is definitely brighter than that red, but this one to the eye is more intense by nature of its relationship with red. It's its complement, you know? And, like, it's really hard to, like, memorize all of those kind of modernist concepts of color, you know, the color wheel and whatnot. And I think that's really where, like, I can't stress how important the color guide is. It's, it's an amazing tool, you know? Like, just starting from, like, um, your client asks, they, they kind of want this blue, this, this blue color to be the primary color of their logo, you know? And it, it's very tempting just to make a logo with this blue and shades of monochromatic white and black, but you can actually produce a lot of rich tones of blue going into the color guide, finding out what its primary complement is, incorporating this into the color blends, you know? Also, get com get some of your high contrasts, you know, work with the modulation of cold colors and warm colors. Um, are these analogous colors, you know? It's like this, from here to here, I mean, we're, we're talking about blues, but see how many differences of blues there are. Um, so there's, there's a lot there to be said, and if anything, it is, it's, it's a type of thing where when it, this, what this is, these color blending modes, these, it's much like playing music, you know, it's tuning, it's, it's, it's subtle shifts, it's not an absolute, uh, I know exactly what I want and this is how I get it, that's, that's not what it is, and I think if you approach it from that angle, then you're not going to get things which appear realistic, you know, because it, they begin to realize as you work towards them, you know? Like, it, it's literally, like, technically it's, they, they, they're realized and, like, you hit, like, a perfect alignment of color combos and contrasts, you know? But the thing is, is to hit that alignment, it's, it's a fun, it's a fun process, you know? It's, it's using different blending modes, like, experimenting, um, like saying, how does changing this one green color affect the property of the shield? Oop. Let me zoom in here. Like, what if this was another red color? You know, like just notice how, like, by stacking gradients, I I now have like. Whenever you change one color, it mathematically like trickles down in divisions and changes the entire consistency of the image as a whole. And I think that's the main advantage of working with color in, in the form of gradients in Illustrator. And I think that um, working in this manner, you, you will always be able to produce more vivid graphics, you know? Like, at some point, you're going to drag this into Photoshop and I think most people try to do a lot of effects in Photoshop using the dodging and the other tools there, but um, I think just like it's very critical to produce forms with very simple contours, because I mean, like, someone else might pick up this graphic up and it needs to be easy for them to edit too, you know, and so be very intentional about, like, if you do blend colors, like, make make the effects you want in the least amount of blends possible, which is kind of where I was going with um, this graphic, you know? Like, each one of these layers is very intentional in um, its intent, you know? Like, your main color, you have the edge of the shield, you have the outer curves of the shield, you have the main glint, and then you have the chamfer, or like the kind of cubby of the shield, and then you have its highlight. So it's, I mean, it's not, when they're all overlaid, it might be kind of confusing, but the thing is, is like, each one of these amounted as a collective 
just begins to make things like this, you know. And this is something that most designers will typically pursue with raster graphics in Photoshop. And I think that to that notion, like, Photoshop allows you to go much deeper than that. And um, I think I'll end on that note. But um, the next video we'll discuss. Um, can't decide which one I want to do first. Um, one of them is going to talk about the uh, the new Retina display. What does that mean for all of this? You know, like can I take shortcuts, or how can like what can I do with pixels now that we have? Or what is a Retina display? You know. And so um, I'm definitely going to have a video discussing that, um, also showing you using different types of apps, this same process, you know, you, like, the, the concept of, um, where is it at? The concept of blend modes is something that is significant because it's not just in this app. It's not just in Photoshop, you know? It's, it's in a lot of programs, and these not only are able to produce and kind of mimic different properties of, I guess, more realistic or dimensional graphics, but they also allow you to really and very easily shift an entire image towards something more desirable, uh, maybe more perceptual, or with intent to address a specific audience, you know? And it's like these, it's, it's, it's the type of thing where each one of these is a formula between two pixels, right? The pixels that like coexist here and here. Well, I mean, in this case, working with vector gradients. Um, but you get the idea. So I'll be talking about how the, uh, the retina display screen kind of enables a, a higher degree of freedom working with these. And then the, uh, the third video, or it might be the second, I'm not sure which one, um, I'll be discussing a way more technical concept. Um, and it's essentially working with the medium of pixels as kind of modes of light. I'll be talking about like writing scripts which perform these actions in sequence to images. Um, you can make take a lot of shortcuts when you're editing pictures. You can also do things like, uh, I mean, I, I would have never have done it for this logo specifically. Um, where is it at? I don't think I would have done it to this logo. But sometimes I get a drawing from a client that's like very specific, but they drew it, they drew it pretty nicely. So how do I take that really like napkin sketch drawing with Photoshop, you know, like run a script to kind of reduce it to this, you know? And then how do I, editing the pixels alone, like prepare the shift of pixels to like be able to be traced in InDesign, you know, or Illustrator. Like I, I could have cut out this entire first section of creating this form if I had just traced this. And that's, that's a, another topic in the discussion of, um, um, it's, it's, it's not the discussion of the differences between raster and vector, it's a discussion on what it is about raster that like actually, not only to a program, but to the eye, begins to delineate edge, you know? It's talking about not the contrast of colors, but how do you begin to contrast contrasts themselves. Um, so, with that said, wow, that's very long.